It is so, so great. Thank you. So great to see every single one of your beautiful faces. Um, sabbatical was amazing, let me tell you. So refreshed. But let me tell you, four weeks go by really fast. I was like, are you serious? It's time to go back? Uh, but how many of I left you guys in really good hands? Did you guys get blessed by that? Every single one of my friends that came and spoke here said, man, your church is crazy amazing. They fell in love with every single one of you. They were so impressed by not only you, the people that obviously makes the church, but they were so impressed on how supportive you guys were. And uh, in, in a moment where we're having to take some time off to refresh, to get restored. Listen, this has been so uh, rejuvenating, not only for my wife and I, but let me tell you, I've been hanging out since I've been back with some pastor friends, and they're all shocked. They're like, you did what? I'm like, yeah, I left the church for four weeks. And they're like, how did you do that? And these are pastor friends that have been doing ministry for way longer than I have. But every single one of them were inspired. They said, you know what? We're going to take a sabbatical. And I, I, I'm, just, I'm just so thankful that we have a staff, a leadership. We have elders and pastors that really have supported my wife and I, that believe not only in the vision that God has given Elevate Church, but they believe in us. There's nothing more special than when you have people that believe in you. Amen? There's nothing more special. Never underestimate the value of the people that you're surrounded by. Be thankful for that. Have gratitude for that. So I want to say on behalf of my family, thank you so much for being just so incredibly amazing. As a matter, matter of fact, last week you guys had Mike Rovner. Did you guys like Mike? Yeah. Mike said to me, he gave me a call yesterday and he said, or the day before, I'm all mixed up on my days. But uh, he said, hey, he's like, hey, Mauricio, don't be shocked if you start seeing me periodically sit in your church service. And, uh, and I, said, I said, really, Mike? He's like, yeah. He's like, let me tell you something. There's something special about that church. And uh, God's presence is in that house. And so uh, can we give it up for Jesus and for you as well? Come on. Thank you so much. All right. Let's see if I remember how to do this again. No, we're starting this new series. Did you guys like that video? Listen, we did this, uh, uh, this video for Easter a few years ago. And I've watched it personally. I've watched it probably at least 20, 30 times. I never get sick of the video because that's the reality of people of God who were before us, who were willing to sacrifice. Let me tell you something. They sacrificed all these different apostles, sacrificed their lives for the very purpose of getting the word of God into your hands, into my hands, into this entire hands of the world. I mean, the gospel meant something to them. It was real to them. And how many know that today in our society, we live in a culture where uh, very rarely do you hear the actual word of God being preached, even from pulpits anymore. It's more uh, make me feel better type of messages. And I'm not trying to, you know, point my finger at any ministry. I'm not, I'm not doing that. But you keep hearing the culture and, and it's almost like we're drawing further and further away from God's truth. And then we can become so... Um, we can become so uh, in a place of danger of without even knowingly but unknowingly start creating a different doctrine that becomes very dangerous to uh, our family, that can become very dangerous to uh, God's kingdom, that can become very dangerous even to the people that you connect with. Listen, every single person that you and I are coming in contact with are being hopefully infected in an awesome way. Now, this was pretty cool because uh, as you hear the message today, it'll connect. I had a lady, I, I, I don't know her, she approached me after the 8 o'clock and she said, have you ever been to a place called Huatulco? And I said, yeah, I have. And she said, because, you know, we had a tour guide and, and mind you, Huatulco is like 2,200 miles away. We do a lot of ministry in Oaxaca, right? So this is just a small little, tiny little town, a lot of indigenous people where I went. And she said, well, this guy, when we told him we live in L.A., uh, he said, hey, I have a friend in L.A. And, 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 and she's like, who's your friend? He's like, yeah, this guy named Mauricio. And, and she's like, 
She looked at her husband. She's like, there is no way. There's no way. 2,244 miles away. There is just no way. And she approached me. She's like, hey, listen. She's like, you ever been to Huatulco? I'm like, yeah, I have. Yeah, you know, of course, we do ministry there a lot in Oaxaca and different parts of that. And she said, there's this guy. His name is Ivan. He says he knows you. And I'm trying to remember, Ivan, Ivan, Ivan. Because I've, I've, I've talked to so many people. It's like, yeah, you know, their, their, their family, they own this, uh, this company. But when she started breaking down who he was, I'm like, yes, Ivan, I led him to Jesus. Let me tell you something. Everywhere you go, everywhere, everywhere, your workplace, Starbucks, Ralph's, mall, Everywhere you go, people are watching you. And what are the odds that these, this, this family who's pretty new to our church ends up at Elevate Church and there's a connection between that and the gospel of Jesus Christ? Come on, that's the church. Say, I'm the church. I'm the church. And so I really believe that we need to start living with a burning conviction that nothing is impossible with God any longer. There has to be this burning desire. There has to be this burning passion that not only do we read the Bible, but we live the Bible. It's not how many verses I've memorized. It's how many verses do I live. Amen? It's find even one verse and let that be the theme of your life. And when you take God's word and you start living out the word, let me tell you something. We start becoming like what John, uh, uh, the book of John starts saying, and the word became what? Flesh. And it dwelt what? Among them. Jesus is the word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And nothing, everybody say, nothing was made that was made without the word of God. Listen, the word is not just letters on a page. The word is living. It's active. The word wants to renew your mind. The word wants to change your life. The word wants to bring hope. The word wants to bring healing. The word is powerful. The word is Jesus. And we need this word more than ever. We cannot allow this culture to completely water us down from the truth, from faith. As a matter of fact, one of our values is faith. You look on that little uh poster board it says we value faith what is faith to elevate church what does faith mean to us it means it dares you to see things differently you got to be different you have to be set apart there has to be something unique about you and me that doesn't say that we look like everybody else and how many know that in this culture everyone's just trying to fit in somewhere God's not calling you to fit in God's not calling you to fit into this counterculture that we live in. God wants us to be separate, to, to look different, to think different, to smell different, to believe different, to dare different. Are you here with me today? And so you look at these stories of the disciples like, man, they literally gave their life to get the word in our hands, this holy Bible, this powerful word. They were willing to to be martyrs for God. And aren't you glad that we didn't live in that era? God's not asking you to go be crucified upside down on a cross. God's just asking you to believe him, to trust him, to take this gospel into all the world and to share it with people that are far away from God. Like this is our mission. Every single, you want to know what your purpose is? It's to take God's word everywhere. Listen, I love the fact that every single one of you may have a career. Lo listen, Enjoy your career. Love what you do. That's fine. But is there Jesus anywhere ingrained in the fabric of your life in that career choice that you decided to, to do? The fabric of Jesus needs to be everywhere you go. And we're going to talk about fabric in a little bit. But listen, for 2,000 plus years, this world has tried to stop the gospel. This world has tried to stop the church from moving forward. For 2,000 plus years, since the time of Jesus to his disciples and everybody after that, people have tried to stop and to hinder the gospel. But how many know that today, in this world, the Holy Bible is still the number one bestseller out of any book that exists on planet Earth? You cannot stop God. That's why he says, I'm the author and I'm the finisher of your story. Come on, aren't you glad that someone has already written your story, but he's also the author and the one who's going to finish that story? You have to know the author, amen? 
It's so powerful. I love this. They tried. As a matter of fact, as I was preparing and studying for this new series, which today I'm just going to lay some foundation, but I was um, looking into where, where is the greatest movement of God taking place on planet Earth right now. And I was hoping to, you know, to possibly read either America or Asia. But to my big surprise, the fastest growing religion of Christianity is in Iran. Right now, Iran is the fastest growing movement of people coming to Christ. Now, we're talking about Muslims, okay, who are people that were raised as Muslims who are radically being touched by God and who are now having underground churches. I mean, they're literally hiding pages from the Bible so that they're not martyred. They're going to underground church services. Like right now, you're not underground. You're above ground. Amen. You get to show up here. You even get to church late. Those people, they're just trying to find a way to get in without getting killed. Can I get an amen there? Amen. Quiet little Pentecostal church. <laughs> yeah, they, they ain't trying to sneak in during worship. No, man, they're just trying to get in to get God's word because they know that God's word is so real. It's wrecking them for new. It means something to them. It means something so much that they're willing to sacrifice just to get a message from God. I think that today, if not careful, we're in a place called danger. Listen, the gospel is dangerous. It is dangerous. It's, high, it's actually, it's like a double-edged sword. It's a blessing, but it can also be a cursing. Let me tell you what I mean by that. It's a blessing because the gospel is so dangerous, it'll wreck your life for good. Obviously, 2,000 years later, the gospel's still going strong, amen? And God really doesn't need our help, does he? <laughs> but he is, he says we're co-laborers, we're partners in this. But it's also a cursing because you know what? Throughout your time as a Christian, however long some of you have been walking with God, you, you can become so desensitized or so watered down. You can become so self-consumed that all of a sudden you start creating your own doctrine. You start creating your own theology. You start taking things that you used to believe and all of a sudden you start questioning whether or not you believe that anymore based on the experiences that you've had on this earth. Whether it's been someone who hurt you, whether it's someone who's betrayed you, whether it's someone who lied to you, whether it's someone who hurt you, haven't you noticed that today, more than ever, depression, depression, anxiety is rampant on this earth? Let me tell you why. Because the enemy knows that if he can start bringing these dark moments and experiences and situations, and, and obviously you know how the devil is. He'll always try to get in some way to cause some havoc and confusion and chaos. And then what happens is we start questioning if God is who he says he is. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. That's why we must, we must know the word of God. It's not just know the word of God. I need to know Jesus. And, and one of the things I said before I left, and I told the congregation if you were here, it was my last Sunday here. I said to the church, I said, I'm a little bit nervous. I said, because as I leave on a sabbatical, it's scary because I'm going to find out who really built this church. And what do I mean by that? The Bible says that unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor, labor in what? vain and so I was like oh my lord this is this is where the test comes this is where I'm gonna find out if Mauricio and Virginia have been building this church in vain or whether the Lord has been building the house all along and to my great thank you Jesus surprise Jesus has been building the church because let me tell you something this church has grown more in a month than the last few months come on give the Lord a big hand clap it's about Jesus amen that's the one we worship. We're not here to look at man. Because I promise you, I'll disappoint you. I'll offend you sometimes too. Yeah, I'll get you mad at me sometimes. But aren't you glad that you're not here for me? You're here for him. When you make it about the man, you already have your own doctrine. I will leave that right there. We'll just leave that on park. Okay. <laughs> Come on, the Bible. The Bible teaches you how to have better living. The Bible teaches you how to, better, have, how to have a better marriage. It teaches you how to, how to have better thinking. The Bible will teach you how to, how to get out of poverty. Not just, listen, not just financially, okay, which that would be good. But it'll, 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 it'll teach you how to stop, stop having this broke mindset, right? This, this word will literally renew your mind. 
this word literally goes to the crevices of the deepest places of your heart that's been broken and God knows how to mend every piece back together again and make it whole. Like this word right here, this word is alive. The Bible says my word is living and it's active. And the only way it gets active is when you and I start being intentional and we start engaging with God's word and then change begins to happen. Let's look at John chapter 8 verse 31 and 32. It says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, he said, if you abide in my word, if you what? Abide in my word. There's a big if. If means that if you decide to start looking into me, if my word starts abiding in you, you are my disciples indeed. The original King James translation says, if, you're, if my word abides in you, then you are really my disciples. See, there's a difference between real and really. He's saying, if you have my word inside of you, you're for real. And I love this because he goes on to say, he says, and you shall know the truth and the truth will what? Make you. I'm not trying to be mean hearted. I'm here to bring you the truth. The truth is this, is that most of us have a challenge from ever moving forward from an event or an experience because the fact is, we've all experienced some form of hurt. Everyone here has. But the truth, the truth is that God is the only one that knows how to make you good again. He's the only one who can reset your soul. He's the only one. There's no one greater than him. Jesus, he says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will what? It'll make you free. And how many want to live free and not in torment? Come on, God wants us to live free and not tormented by all kinds of demonic lies that the enemy presents to every single one of us. Here's a simple point real quick you can write down if you'd like. If you want to know Jesus, you can know him through his word. Come on, you really want to know Jesus? You got you to gotta, you gotta begin to know him. It's called a personal intimate relationship with Jesus. I have mentors. I have people I look up to. I have, I have pastors. I love, I love all the people that God has surrounded me with. But let me tell you someone. But no one speaks to me truth like Jesus. No one convicts me like the Holy Spirit. No one nudges me like the Holy Spirit. I believe in accountability, but let me tell you something. Even you can lie to your accountability partner. But you can't lie to God. See, you think you're reading your word? No, God's reading you while you're reading his word. The word will confront you. The word will convict you. The word will challenge you. The church should not just be a place of comfort. The church should also be a place where you're challenged and you're confronted about your dysfunction. Because we're all dysfunctional. Come on, we all got a little cray cray in us. Come on. Let's all agree to that. We all got a little bit of craziness in here. I know I do. I know you don't, but I do. Huh? There's a little dysfunction on this Mauricio guy. Yeah. But guess what? The church is also a place where God says, I want to confront your dysfunctionality. I want to begin to address those issues. I want to begin to address your heart. I want to challenge you because I know there's more inside of you. Here's what the word theology means in the Webster's Dictionary, just so you have an understanding what I mean by dangerous theology. Theology means the study. Everybody say the study. See, you'll never know him until you study under him. What does a disciple mean? The word disciple means student. It means learner. And so often, if we're not careful, we can sit in churches, whatever church, or even put our headsets on and listen to any podcast, but you're not really being a student. You're more just kind of just listening with ears, but you're not really hearing what the Spirit of God is saying. So when we're talking about God's theology, God's word, we're talking about studying the religious faith practicing it but also experiencing the fruit of it as well god wants us to come to that place where we are drawing closer to him where we're desiring to know him we want to know not only who he is but i want to know god why am i on this earth 
What's your plan for my life on this earth? And let me tell you something. For some of you that are struggling, like, what's my purpose? What's my call? What's my th-? I'll tell you what your call is. Take the gospel everywhere you go and then watch God reveal to you and he'll begin to literally unfold the very meaning of why you're on this earth. It all starts with reaching people with the love of Jesus Christ. It starts there. That's, it. That's how it happened to me. You think, you think I wanted to be a pastor? Heck to the no. Because I know, I, listen, I've seen pastors. I know what they go through. I had different plans. I had a whole nother, my path was different. But the, but the closer I got to Jesus, the, 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 the more I put my ear to the heart of Jesus, I started realizing that God started changing my heart. Because how many know that you and I can have the ability to dream anything we want? Aren't you glad that we can dream in America, especially America? But let me tell you something. Sometimes we fail to understand that your dreaming was just the inception of you beginning to understand who God was. It was the first version. But then you get the real version of the dream that God has for your life. And so I always tell people, listen, dream, that's okay. Start there, but it ends with God. It always ends with God. And God wants to show something amazing to every single one of us. So learning theology is vital for your spiritual growth. I already know that, and you know that. In fact, good theology is critical for avoiding dangerous doctrines and it also helps prevent you from error now let me show you what james 2 19 says and then we're going to get into this message are you ready look at this james 2 19 says you believe that there is one god all right you do well even the demons believe that and they tremble in other words do you realize that that satan's demons completely understands the word of god cover to cover I mean, think about it. Those demons used to be God's angels. Satan used to be God's worship leader. But what happened to Satan? His real name was Lucifer at the time. What happened to Lucifer? Lucifer started losing sight of the correct theology. Pride came in, got very egotistic, and then all of a sudden he started thinking to himself, I can do this better than God. It's kind of like you and I, when we think that we don't need God in the situation that we're in right now. When you think that God's not enough, you've already created a doctrine. Let me say that again. When you think that God's not enough, if, if someone tells you, you know, this is what God's saying, and you're just like, oh, no, uh, no, uh, that's a doctrine. And it's so powerful that Satan was able to convince a third of the angels to go with him. So when Satan got the boot from heaven, all the third of the angels went with him. And guess what? They understood the presence, the person, and the power of God. So when this verse says, you believe that there's one God, good for you. You do well, but guess what? But the demons also believe, but they tremble. In other words, they believe with fear. We should have this healthy fear in our life to when we read, when we read this word, when we start reading the scriptures, when you start welcoming the Holy Spirit to bring the word to life in your, in your heart, let me tell you something. There should be a holy reverence. There should be such a respect where you're saying, man, God, I got to change my attitude. Man, God, I got to change my lifestyle. Man, God, I got to change my language. Man, I got to start, I got, you got to let it confront you. And I'm not here to judge you. Maybe you got a little cuss in you right now. It's okay. We all work as cuss experts at one point. Everyone here. But how many of that God's not moved by your dysfunction? God just wants you to know him. He says, if you abide in me, I'll wreck you for good. I'll change your life. I'm glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> Look at this, Titus one night. And then I'm going to share a quick story with you. It says the message, as, as, as it has been taught, can be trusted. He must hold what? You must hold what? Why do we got to hold firmly? Because you're going to reach a point in your life where you're going to start letting go a little bit by little bit. So he says hold, another version says hold fast the confession of your faith. So he says hold firmly. Hold it firmly. Hold firmly to it. Then he will be able to use true teaching to comfort others and to build them what? Up. 
up. So it's not just about the church comfort me. Oh, comfort me. Oh, feel bad for me. No, 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 listen. No, it's about the church bringing comfort to you, and it's also about the church building you up. And let me tell you something. Building you up doesn't always look nice. Building you up means telling you the truth. Not telling you what you want to hear. It's telling you what you need to hear. That's building you up. And he says, it's building them up, and he will be able to prove that people who are opposite are wrong. And how many know that, that, that opposites attract when you're different? Let me say that again. Opposites attract when you're different. And so God wants you and I to be different. Now let me tell you a story. This is so good because this all happened recently. And I won't tell you when or who because then you'll start fishing. Um, <laughs> But very recently, I was blown away. I was in a room with a whole bunch of people that are like influencers, man. I'm talking influencers. And as I was in this room with influencers, we were there because there's um, someone that all of us know mutually some way. And this person is facing something so, so critical, very, very challenging. And while we were there, we were going around the room and just talking and, and you know, we're we're bringing comfort to the situation. But then we started building up. And, 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 and as we were getting through the build-up part, God gave me a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom for this person. And I just released it. I was obedient to God. And, uh, and, and boom. And the, the person was like, wow, and weeping and just excited. And, and, and faith was high and everything. In that same moment... In the same room, someone with influence said this. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you heard all that. We're talking about influence in, Christian, in the Christian movement. Okay, that's, okay you, that's so great. I'm so glad everybody got to share. Now, now let me tell you your reality. I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. I'm like, no, you didn't. Let me tell you your reality. My first thought was this. It's like, hey, goofball. <laughs> no one's saying deny your reality. See, facts and truth are different. The facts does not deny the symptoms. That's all facts is. Facts are the symptoms of what you're experiencing. But how many know, but God's truth knows how to overcome every fact and every symptom that you're experiencing right now. So there is a difference between facts. No one's asking you to be in denial because I know that most of us, okay, we've been maybe in a situation or maybe we, when we were growing up, we went through something that was so traumatic, which, listen, nowadays you're hearing more and more people come out of what they've experienced. We have all have experienced some form of trauma, some form of pain, some form of something that really just messed us up. And those are facts, and no one's saying deny the facts. But that's why Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? But do you still believe that? Because this person had the audacity to walk in there after we brought comfort and building up in the same moment and come back and say, hey, but let me tell you your reality now. That's, that's what we're living now. And, and listen, and you don't have to be outright spoken to open your mouth and say something like that. But how many know that your attitude of your heart can already be living that without you having to express it with your mouth. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? But also out of the heart flow all the issues of what? Life. So in true reality, you may think just because you go to church that my doctrine is correct, not realizing, but my actions are an error. Amen? I'm not judging. Just bringing the truth. And we, listen, and we all have had a moment of doubt and unbelief. Every single one of, one of us, including myself, where we have doubted God or we had a little spirit of unbelief for a second. They're like, man, I don't know if this is going to, you know, we've all been there, all of us. But when you're talking about being in a room, and, and that's where I just thought about this, this series. I'm like, man, God, you know what? You, you, you let me see this. You, you, you definitely let me see this because, man, now I know that this series is for a reason. You're talking to the church. The question is, is the church listening? 
Amen? Because he said in that verse, he must hold firmly to it. And I love it because, you know what, uh, we were asked to even walk out to leave the room. I was like, what the? Okay, I'm like, all right, chill. I ain't going to say nothing. But what was pretty powerful is that how many know that truth overcomes reality? Okay, when, when this guy was done, he comes out, ignored everybody, beelined me. And he said, hey, when can we meet? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why he beelined. Because the truth will always favor you. The truth will always be with you. The truth will deliver you. The truth, listen, the truth will bring a fragrance about you that others will be drawn to. People are just looking for some truth. Listen, I know we're not perfect. No one's perfect in this room. But when you love God, when you know him, let me tell you something, the conviction of the spirit of God, that conviction to want to do good. And I know that it's not easy to do good all the time. It's not always easy to do the right thing all the time. But you hook up, link up, man, you, you shack up with God. And let me tell you something. When, when stuff happens, you're going to be like, no, that ain't for me. No, that, that, I, I serve a God who's greater than this situation. And you start thinking different. I'm telling you. It's, there's something special about it. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be having some lunch this week with this guy. I know I have to still catch up to like 10 years worth of work this week. But, uh, but I love it. Let's use an example quickly. Let's get out of here. The perfect example, you look at Joseph. How many know the story of Joseph? Great story, right? He's the, uh, the 17-year-old kid that has been given a dream by God. And, um, and, and I love the fact that God is, a, God is a God who will give you visions and dreams. I love that. But how many know that you can also, you can also uh, err in the doctrine of dreams and your dream can become your distraction eventually? Like you can take Jesus out of the dream and now it's just a dream. And you're, you can be so consumed with the dream or your vision or what you want to accomplish, but there's no Jesus in it. And I want you to understand, there, th this story is about uh, not just a dream, but it was actually about the dreamer. And so here you have Joseph who is hated by everybody. I mean, he was hated by his brother. He had 14 brothers. And I know that when you look at how his father loved him, there's a reason for it. It's not that he didn't love his, his other sons any less. It's just that his other brothers always erred. I mean, all his brothers, including Joseph, all grew up in a household of faith. All of them. They all knew God. All of them. But the 14 brothers that knew God weren't living for God. They kept going left towards darkness they kept choosing all the wrong things the reason that joseph was highly favored was because joseph was staying true to the gospel or the doctrine that his father had instilled in him and so obviously here you have a 17 year old kid who has been walking with god talking with god connected with god honoring his natural father honoring his celestial father he was walking in the favor of god and what was interesting is that he had a coat of many colors Y'all know his code, right? Okay, everybody say opposites attract when you're different. Now, if I would have came into service today dressed like this, you guys would be like, like what happened to him? Goes away four weeks and <laughs> like, is he, is he a fashion statement now? Like, what is he? You know what I'm saying? Like. Like, what happened to him? A little too much Oaxaca. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, no. Would I Listen, let's be honest. If you were walking around like this, do you think every eye would be on you? Yes. I, 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 you yes. Don't lie. If you walked into Starbucks like this, I promise you, every eye would do this like. Because it would be a little bit different. Like, you know what I'm saying? It just, it'd be like. You're out of place. Like, you don't belong. Let me, let me tell you something. When, when you carry the gospel, you look different. You smell different. You talk different. You live different. You believe different. You smile different. The joy is different. Your happiness is different. Your hope is different. Everything is different. But let me tell you something. The reason it's so hard to look different 
is because when you're different, it attracts the opposite, and then you start having haters. That's what happened to Joseph. Let's read about Joseph. Are you ready? Quick. Let me get a pianist up here. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3 through 11 says this. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a coat of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. Okay, so he's 17 years old and they hated him even more. Have you ever been so hated for your transformation? Like, listen, man, my, my, my family would be honest, okay? When I came to Christ, my mom and my sisters were mad. You know why? Because they missed the old me. And they're like, okay, why are you acting different? And it's so interesting because when you come to Christ, he says, you're a new creature. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? new so there has to be something different about you you can't just wear the title and not have the lifestyle and so my mom I'll never forget my mom and, and my mom comes to this church and, and, I, and she was here I would put her on blast right now but my mom was you know she was she was lost she didn't have Christ so she was like you did what and they started seeing this metamorphosis transformation because they remember the old me, the drinking me, the violent me, the angry me, the unhappy me. And it's almost like they missed that old me. And I, I really believe that that's what happens with most Christians. Like you can become so afraid of wearing the coat of many colors because you're afraid of the opposition you're going to get when you start having that change. You care too much. You value too much man's opinion rather than just coming to that place of having character and saying, no, this relationship between me and God, it's real. It's so real that I'm willing to sacrifice and I'm willing to look different no matter what anybody says. Amen? No matter what anybody says. There we were, blinding sheaves in the field. So now I sound the dream. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. So in other words, all kinds of things are growing and they're all just bowing down to me. They didn't like that. And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. How many know that, that you and I, we're carrying the word of God everywhere we go? And listen, and it's not popular. When you're living for Jesus, it's not popular. As a matter of fact, they have names for you. Jesus freak, right? Radical. So, I, I like this one. Oh, do you go to one of those charisma churches? <laughs> like they label us. Are you those Holy Ghost churches? No, man, we're a Bible-believing church, period, end of story, man. We love Jesus. That's who we are, amen? You don't have to be labeled by this world just to fit in. God's not asking you to fit in. God's asking you to stand out, to look different. And so here, then he dreams still another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and, his, and he said, look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and, I, and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. In other words, the dad started having a revelation from heaven, thinking like, man, maybe my son... My son is being shown something. But how many know that God's dream also involves decisions on your part? It's not just, don't make it just about a dream. See, when you make it all about the dream, you're, gonna, you're going to end up creating a different doctrine. It's called the doctrine of pride, right? It's called the doctrine of unbelief. It's called the doctrine of, of disappointment. Those are doctrines. You know why? Because they become your belief system. And whatever you believe is how you end up behaving. And how you behave ends up becoming who you are. And that's why God's saying, hold fast, hold firm 
to the words I have given you. So Joseph's story, I know that when we teach it, and I've taught it this way as well, and it's true, it's a story about pain, right? We know that Joseph, yes, he was favored. We know that Joseph was, was someone that was carrying God's word inside of him. We know that. But we also know that Joseph had to go through so much pain in order to see the dream. He had to go through a lot of suffering, right? He was, you know, thrown in a pit by his brothers because they wanted to just let him die in the pit. But then they said, hey, how about instead of just letting him die, die how about we make a little extra money so they sold him for 20 shekels as a as a slave so now he goes from the pit to being a slave to he's now in Potiphar's house but guess what as he's in there every single place that he's experiencing through his life though he was going through pain and suffering God kept favoring him everything he put his hands to would prosper so much that when he was in the palace you know, and he was cleaning the palace. They made him overseer. Then he went to prison because he was being accused of rape. And he was innocent. As a matter of fact, man, he had so much conviction that when sin came running at him, he ran from it. He had to make a decision. I got to run from this because it's going to take me out. Amen. So guess what? The story of Joseph is not really a story about a dream. It's a story about character. Because the anointing can only keep you where character takes you. Character, character, character. Listen, he was no longer thinking about the dream. He was just thinking about his decision. How am I going to handle this thing right now? Forget WWJD. What would Jesus do? How about this one? WWLD. What would love do in this situation? Instead of being so irritated and angry and ornery and ah how about just say okay what character am i going to have in this situation no matter how bad the situation is i have to walk in love i have to walk in grace i have to let me tell you something the reason jesus was constantly persecuted you want to know why he had so much opposition because he was he was he was someone who brought grace and truth and they didn't like that. Like, whoa, 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 what you mean? You How can you give him grace? He deserves death because of sin. Remember the girl that was about to be stoned for committing adultery? He said, hey, which one of you has no sin? He who has no sin cast the first stone. Every stone dropped to the ground. You know why? Because grace showed up. But it's not grace without truth. And the truth is that God is willing and able to forgive every single one of us of our sins. Amen. But we have to make a decision to turn our life back to God. Amen. No matter how far you are today, you got to make a decision to come back to truth. He's not just grace. He's grace and truth. And without truth, there is no grace. And without grace, there's no truth. So that's why he was hung on a cross. Because he brought grace, but he also brought truth. Opposition. I love this. Man, and, and I love this because, you know, Joseph, man, he was, he was carrying with him a very crazy dream, man. It was just out of this world. Like, the things was, that God was showing him, but, but he wasn't really making it about the dream. And, and you know what? When you think about this coat, this coat for, for Joseph symbolized the favor of God that was on him. It, 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 it symbolized the word of God that was in him. And, and I really believe that, that even though his, his brothers hated him with a passion, I, I honestly believe that there's two things that Joseph would say to you and I. If, if he was standing here preaching at Elevate Church this morning, these are the two things he would say. Number one, he would say, people accept what is the same, but they eventually respect what is different. Let me say that again. People will accept when you fit in, but they'll respect you when you stand out. And if you just want to be accepted and fit in, hey, listen, that's your own doctrine. But if you want to be respected, you have to stand out and look different. That means that you speak different. That means that you believe different. That means that you, you, you walk different. That means you talk different. If you're not talking different, you're just being accepted. In other words, the world just tolerates you. They know you're a Christian, but they already know what you're not living. Amen? And, and Joseph knew he was hated. The second thing he would say, he says, people don't necessarily hate you. They hate what's inside of you. 
Let me tell you something. It wasn't that, because I've heard people say to them, it's like, Pastor, like, dang. You know, like, like, since I've come to Christ, like, people do not like me. And I bring them the truth in grace. I'm like, hey, bro, here's the truth. You were just blind, but now you can see no one's ever liked you. But at least now they don't like you with a purpose. Because <laughs> you look different. There's something different about you. That's why they don't like you. Because you know what? They start seeing. They start seeing the coat of many colors. And they're like, man, now we don't like you because you don't talk the way we talk anymore. You don't, you don't coast gesture like we used to make jokes. You're not laughing at our perverse jokes anymore. All of a sudden, why? You're different. It's not that you're trying to be holy thou art. It's just that, nah, man, I don't, I don't do that. Come on. Listen, when, when, when you look different, you party different. Huh? Let me say that again. When you look different, you party different. Can't be all up in the clubs. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, 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 uh. He said, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, not under the influence of things that alter your mind. Huh? I'm going to smoke this weed. It's from the earth. No. <laughs> Peruvian snowflake, whatever you guys call that stuff, man. I don't know what you call it, but let me tell you something. It's a portal, and it opens up the darkness, man. You start seeing things. And I'll tell you this, it ain't God. God's not showing up there. There's a different doctrine of demon that shows up there. And it'll start convincing you, yeah, see, man, we're so happy. Yeah, stop doing the weed, and then you find out the reality. Oh, yeah, let's not go there, huh? Oh, y'all ain't happy. You're like, man, bring another guest speaker, will you? <laughs> That's what you get for sending me away for a month. All right, let's get out of here. You guys getting something? Okay, now what does this mean? Job, Job 29, 14. He says, put on righteousness. He says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. It what? It clothed me. In other words, here's what Jesus said. He said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to put on the garment of God. Come on. One thing I can say about Joseph, he was hated. But let me tell you something. That man had courage to wake up the next day. And to put on that coat again. Knowing he's being hated. The question is, do you have the courage to put on your coat? Do you have the courage to stand out? Do you have the courage to look different? Or are you going to just keep fitting in? You're just going to fit in so that I'm accepted. No, I don't want to be accepted. I want to be respected. Amen? He says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was a robe and a diadem, okay? In other words, let me give you a few points. Righteousness clothes a man as with a garment. How, how does that, what does it do for me? It, everybody say, it covers. Listen, every single one of us will miss it. Every single one of us will disappoint someone. Every single one of us will miss the mark. But how many know that the love of God will cover you? When you put on righteousness, it's either keep living the way you want to live or come to the place and say, I need to be covered by God. First Peter 4, it says this, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a what? Multitude of sins. God's righteousness will cover you. He'll cover you. But you can't keep living that way either. Remember, grace and truth. Grace and truth. Not like, oh, great, man, he's just going to cover it all for me. No, 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 no. No, he's going to cover you while he's dealing with your heart. Number two, it protects. Everybody say it protects. Listen, the garment, we understand that it protects us from all the elements of outside, right? From the cold, from the winds, from the dust. It does protect, right? It's a beautiful thing. Righteousness is more than a garment. Okay, Ephesians 6.14 says this. Stand therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. How many know that when you're clothed with Jesus, he'll guard your heart? He'll help, he, listen, he'll protect you from, from being uh, in that very dark place of offense and, and betrayal. Like, you'll be able to come to the place and be like, no, God, God you're going to guard my heart through this situation. You're going to protect me. You're going to protect this heart from being bitter. Number three, 
You know what his righteousness does? It's fragrant. Everybody say fragrant. Yeah, that means that this, this righteousness is, is, is not only something that, that's a garment of something that's thick and something that's warm, but, man, there's a smell, there's an aroma. 2 Corinthians 2.15 2 says this, God considers us to be the pleasing smell that Christ is spreading. He is spreading it among people who are being saved and people who are dying. Number four, it cannot be hidden. Come on, listen, you can't keep hiding your coat of many colors. Come on, you can't be wearing your coat on Sunday and then come Monday you're at work and there is no coat. No, you got to go ahead and wake up proud. Come on, you got to wake up and, and, and have conviction and say, you know, Lord, I know I'm not perfect, but today I'm going to wear my coat with courage. Amen. And people will walk and see me or they'll be, they'll be looking at me weird like, man, you're different. But eventually they're going to they're going to respect what I believe. Amen. And so look at what this this means in Matthew 5, 14, it says you are the light of this world. A city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. In other words, it is not a secret that should be confined. It's not, the gospel is not a secret to be kept. Don't have that mindset that thinks like, well, I want to respect other people's religion. Let me tell you something. This world has no respect, period. You know what that tells me when people say, well, I don't want to offend anyone. You're already an offense. Because you, you're already basically saying the gospel is offensive. No, it's not offensive. Don't be ornery about it. But when you walk in love, let me tell you something. There's something different when you have a Christian who walks in the love of Christ and a Christian who just walks around with information of Christ. Big difference. You walk in the love of Jesus. Man, maybe you've missed the mark. Put on the righteousness of God. He'll protect you. He'll cover you. But you can't, you can't hide it clothes you. This has to be my fabric. Stand on your feet. Let's go. This gospel has to be real to you and me. This gospel has to bring conviction. 